Hi there, everyone. My name is Will. I'm a team member here at Conquer Life, and we're here at our headquarters today with comic Hannah Roshlein. Um, you might recognize Hannah from um, some of the interviews that have been done here before, but today we kind of switched it up a little bit. I'm going to be in the interviewer seat, and I'm going to be talking with Hannah about her career in comedy, her sobriety, and everything in between. Hi, Hannah. Hi, Will. Thanks for being here. Yeah, with me. of course. Thank you for sitting down with me. So, starting off a little bit, um, I wanted to go into your beginning journey with alcohol, like what it was like for you growing up, that, and your relationship then, and kind of how it progressed over the years. Uh, alcohol, for me, I'll just say if you aren't familiar with me in any scope, I have been sober from alcohol for the past three and a half years. I'm approaching the four year mark on August 5th. Congratulations. Thank you. But I had had previous to that a 15 year nightmarish sort of relationship with alcohol. But as far as my earliest uh, forays into alcohol, I was very late to that party. Um, I was also growing up in the 80s, um, early 90s in small town Indiana. There's not much to do in a place like that but drink. Um, so with that kind of attitude swirling in the air, I had a little bit of, like I said, a different path into alcoholism. I, uh, my dad currently and formerly was the pastor of a church. And so alcohol wasn't something that was even available in my house growing up. So I didn't have to like look at it or be confronted with it. But I did have a father who not only was at, you know, the helm of a church, but also very, you know, not preachy to us, but, but definitely uh, steering us away from alcohol, not only because of the biblical uh, things that he believed, but also because of his former relationship with alcohol, which he made very clear to me when, when I was young, which was before he kind of found Jesus and turned his life around, he also was a former hardcore lush, you know? So it's like, I grew up with this knowledge that alcoholism ran in my family, even if I did not know how pervasive that was going to be within my own genetics and to see it manifest later so like actually I was in high school really well behaved still I um, like I said Asian mom pastor dad I was scholarshiped when I went to IU and so like I just was kind of like not abusing or even touching alcohol at that point it wasn't easy for me to get and I there was just other ways to piss my parents off and so when I went to IU though that's when I started drinking for the very first time around 18 to 19 years old. And then I did not stop for 15 years. Yeah. So, so did it start like, was it immediately like an everyday thing or was it gradually like you tried it and it just became more and more often you would drink or the qu like quantity? Because of the sheer passage of time and frankly how many drinks I did consume in that decade and a half, I don't know if I can in good faith even like really un like remember clearly the formative years. But you know, like young 20s alcoholism, it's like it was a pervasive part of the culture and still is. Especially in a college setting too. 100%. Yeah. I also started serving right away, like when mm -hmm. I dropped out of college, which is like, and it was honestly, alcohol was a big catalyst of that. I started drinking at IU. I stopped going to class for the first time in my life. I had no one like looking over my shoulder and being like, Hannah, wake up for school. And sure. it turns out I wasn't as self-motivated as I believed myself to be. So. Sure. You know, an alcohol immediately creates a culture of lies mm -hmm. around it at, at the higher levels to just kind of be able to to do and drink the way that you start to. But it's like, yeah. when I was young, I, in it, I had no idea. You're just kind of like, hey, I was aware right away, I will say that. I think most people, if you listen to this and this resonates with you, you know you have an issue. Like, and, you, and I did from the earliest days. Like mm -hmm. my first DUI was 21 years old. Mm -hmm. I didn't get sober 
-hmm. for good until I was almost like 35. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's a long time, you yeah. know, yeah. to watch literally the blood drain out of every face of every person you love, you know, the death of your own dreams. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, I'm doing things now comedically that I've, you know, thought about since I was a small child, but I legitimately put my life on pause and kind of mute mm -hmm. for a really, you know, lengthy period of time mm -hmm. based on the the drinks that were swirling in sure. me. Sure. And frankly, now having them out of my system three and a half years later, I can be like, oh, that's not the only issue. There's clearly a lot of things that have to be addressed within a human being to live a full and like happy and peaceful and you know fulfilled life but at the same time the second alcohol came out of mine everything changed mm -hmm. so i can say with great conviction that for some of y'all the only thing keeping you from everything is alcohol mm -hmm. and that sucks to say and it's like it was hard for me even early on you know that's something like i think that sucks like i think about you know people are like hannah when did you know you needed to get sober? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, every single time, mm -hmm. all the time, in secret and in public. Yeah. You know, my sins went before me in front of everyone, and I'm kind of thankful they did. You mm -hmm. know, looking back now, if I hadn't had a lot of that public falling out and like having to do like a tiny bit of jail time and just like things that, you know, will catch up to you. Sure, hold you when accountable. When you're swimming around like that in that kind of a vat, well, you will just drink yourself to death in secret. Initially, and in a lot of settings, it has a purpose, right? Like in social settings, you know, a lot of people, you know, use alcohol to make themselves more comfortable in social situations or, um, you know, so many different things. So when you first started drinking, what was it do you think that drew you to alcohol? When I first started drinking, it was just because I was finally around it. Mm -hmm. And I had no one to like look at me. I, you know, I spent 18 years being very dutiful. Sure. You know, so it's yeah. like you didn't think I didn't couldn't have just found like a little kegger out in the farm, you know, yeah. fields or whatever. Yeah. My buddies were out there. Yeah. But at the same time, I was like, I got to get out of here and I'm not going to be able to do it like that. I yeah. also just was still holding on to that like third world, you know, if you have an Asian mom, I don't know if you do, but if you do, or an Indian mom or any of those, they make education's very important in all of that. At IU, I was a double major philosophy and political science emphasis pre-med. I was mm -hmm. like, I'm gonna be an orthopedic surgeon or something like that. And you know, even during COVID, I found myself thinking about that where I was like, if you would have gone in there and got everything you ever wanted, your life could be a disaster right now. Yeah. You could be saving people, but the last two years would have been so sad that for mm -hmm. someone like me, if I was like never getting drinking and, you know, if it mm -hmm. had not flared up like it did yeah. early, like if I would have just sat on it, sat on yeah. it and got into it late, I mean, at any point it was going to ignite within me. Sure, sure. You know, so mm -hmm. it's like, that's a, it's an interesting sort of thing. So yeah, a lot of the early on stuff was just like rebellion. And then finally I was like, fuck yeah. yeah. You know, and yeah. then I'm at IU. Yeah. That's the home of little five, yep. dude. Like yep. this, I mean, I had to have gotten roofied at a frat house. I know that's a dark topic, mm -hmm. but it's true. Yeah. They're just, we weren't paying attention to anything and sure. nobody made us pay attention to alcohol except in glamorous ways. Yeah. So it's like, even at IU, it was like, we're playing cornhole, we're drinking. Like it became something so, crazy for me where like I wouldn't even do things in that 15 years of my life if I knew I could not get a drink mm -hmm. quickly mm -hmm. sure so like one I never traveled like outside of the country I was kind of just like in Indiana just like I said slippery slippery fucking noodling around trying to you know drinking mm -hmm. a brick of PBR every two days mm -hmm. and a bottle of Fernet it was extreme but yeah. that's the craziest thing is it was also like celebrated yeah I spent 20 years in upscale fine dining as a server it's like we drank at pre-shift for knowledge mm -hmm. we drank after to celebrate bomb money we drank after to celebrate shitty money we mm -hmm. drank to just commiserate and that was just attached to my whatever yeah. I had all this other you know things like now learning how to move childhood traumas around and just all these different kinds of things you know it's like we don't have I didn't have access to that kind of information mm -hmm. yeah I, th I think that's an interesting point you know with in college and especially being in your 20s and other industries too like the service industry but so many other industries alcohol is 
you know, celebrate it. Like you said, there's always an excuse to partake in drinking and especially growing up in your 20s and even younger than that, you know, it's not really, it's explained a little bit, but not fully how slippery of a slope alcohol can be. Yeah, 100%. So when I was young, like all they were basically telling us about drugs and alcohol was no. Mm -hmm. So like there was no like even dialogue about it. Let's start there. Mm -hmm. If you were just like, okay, but why mm -hmm. can't we have this? Or why is this the legal drinking age for this? And why is that if you had a generally inquisitive mind, it was just still met with don't. Mm -hmm. And so we started there, don't, and that's okay. You know, but then they just like tried to like scare you, but in like, a way that even as a child to me felt silly. Mm -hmm. You know, like the dare, like the, the commercials, they'd put like a front, like a cast iron skillet down and like a couple eggs would fry and they just like, they'd be like, this is your brain on drugs. And I'd be like, Krrr. and then a dad would hit a mom or something and they'd be like, don't. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, easy. Yeah. I don't even know where to get weed, dude. And that is craziness, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know, I just encourage everyone, you know, like, yes, everybody's been dropping the ball all the way across the board and none of this is your fault on, from dialogue to legislation to any of it on down, but we have to be able to start having more like real, raw, uncomfortable conversations with each other, you know, and allowing ourselves to really begin to unpack some of this residue. What do you think overall especially within yourself, but also in general, of the relationship, you know, mental health and alcohol and substances in general can have. Peanut butter and jelly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're together, delicious. They're, mm -hmm. I mean, they're best buds. Mm -hmm. I mean, you'll never, honestly, you can't, I don't think you can even separate them one from the other. Because at high levels, I'm not gonna speak to social drinking and be like, oh, your mental health is poor because you're having a couple drinks. Mm -hmm. But if you're abusing alcohol, your mental health is poor. Like, I don't care if you look like the happiest person on the gram, your mental health is poor mm -hmm. at the highest levels of addiction. There's just no long and short of it. It's like at the blackout level of drinking, your hippocampus is legitimately detaching. So if you're telling me that you're at your highest form, I'm sorry, but you aren't. Mm -hmm. It's like, I, you have to attack this every day from so many angles. And that's annoying to hear because you want somebody to just say, hey, the second you stop drinking, it all gets better, but it doesn't. Mm -hmm. In fact, it all gets realer. And it just is like me staring at something so clearly that it's like, some of the most uncomfortable shifts I've ever felt as a human. But the thing is, you don't cry for very long and that break sets clean and you just move the fuck on. And you don't find yourself with these just like daily aches and pains that you are carrying around by just numbing out with alcohol or drugs or whatever ties that bind, whether it's food or, you know, just even the unnatural, unhealthy, like ways that we talk to ourselves. You know, mm -hmm. these are all just like sorts of, patterns of addictive like coping mechanisms that are completely normal and frankly <clears throat> everybody has them so you know it's like i just feel like they they do go together and to like to talk about them in separate parts you know it's just like i don't think that it's necessarily like unnecessary to understanding of it you can just get a lot more done if you just lump it in in mm -hmm. the fact that like the less of a substance that you have in your body that's something like alcohol or drugs, the better you will operate point blank, period. As you were drinking, was it something in the back of your mind that you were thinking, maybe I'm realizing that maybe this is a problem, maybe I should stop, or kind of going back and forth on that? Or was there just one moment specifically where you're like, you know what, I've had enough, I'm done? For me, rock bottom was ever shifting. Mm -hmm. I kept thinking I knew what it was and then it would bottom out again and I was let known like, hey, this can get worse for you. Mm -hmm. And so like I had that kind of running knowledge. Like I said, I like wrecked my an ex-husband's car when I was like 22 on absinthe in mm -hmm. small town Indiana. It's like that should be a rock bottom moment where you're like, I'm going to 
go to AA tomorrow, and even if I relapse, you know, I'm gonna give it the old college try. But like, I started just accumulating sort of this reverse highlight reel, and it was like, it was bigger than me though. So it's like, I was just constantly, there was like something happening. I'd been offered, I remember at one point, an ex's family, like they were like, you can go to the Meadows, which is a rehab center. But mm -hmm. I frankly just knew that like, I was in so deep. It felt so much bigger than me. Mm -hmm. And then, I, but I also knew that I was like, it was something that I identified with. Like I said, it had become a part of me. I was, I mean, I have mastery level alcoholic in me still to this day, even if I do not exercise it any more. I think there are a million ways to find yourself getting sober. I, I hope that anybody hearing this is like, if you can just bail out in any of those early stages, like do. Like, even if you like, if you're sitting here and you're like, I'm 25 and my life is shit, like kids, I just got sober. Like things are just like getting cooler or feeling more manageable. Like it's all very much okay, but like the faster you can get out, get out. Because at some points you potentially don't get out. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm aware at every ch like turn that like I could still go back to that other side of the street. I have the ability to still, you know, die at the hands of something that frankly tried to take my life at every turn. So with that knowledge, there isn't fear, but there is an understanding that, you know, it's like, hey, for whatever reason, with ever, whatever resonation, like if you hear me clearly and you need, you know, like you said, some like <laughs> just to see the light for the trees, like this isn't your, this isn't your mama's dare program anymore. There's just human beings. I'm not the only one. There's way better ones even than me talking about addiction and sobriety. Then I'll happily point you into those like resources. You know, mm -hmm. I saw that on even the questions list. Like I don't go through AA, mm -hmm. but I think it's a very valuable program. Mm -hmm. And I know it to be because of some conversations I've had with people about it recently a really cool thing anymore where it's like even if you're like smoking weed but you're not drinking there's not so many like straight laced mm -hmm. meetings where it's just like you feel like you can't do one or the other mm -hmm. or what you know there's still some that are super hardcore mm -hmm. and unfortunately for some of you listening to this right now and i know this could be me at any time you can't do any kinds of other drugs when you don't drink because you have to be like almost teetotaling or you're system just will go back to the thing mm -hmm. so i know that you know even some of that other kind of stuff isn't for everyone mm -hmm. but i just want you to hear me say this today there is something for everyone out there that's the nice part the internet is nuts the human network that's already out there and the stories people have and whatever if you get to asking them is nuts so if you need help with someone if you need to look up to someone on any level of you know if it's not me that makes you want to get sober but there's someone else out there they're out there and they're doing it for really long periods of time with a lot of fucking strength and like understanding and comprehension. And it's like, hey, yeah, like I said, you don't, it's not, it, we're not smashing frying pans around anymore. You know, you can just like plug into a lot of things that just aren't corny. Mm -hmm. And shifting a little bit here, let, you're obviously an accomplished comedian and comic. Accomplished is a strong <laughs> word. But, you know, the comedy industry, you know, and people going to some of these shows, you know, it's very tied in closely with alcohol. How has it been navigating your journey as a comedian, being sober, you know, being around people who are drinking a lot of the time in excess? What has that experience been like for you? Tough. I mean, I fortunately do not have right at the second a fragile sobriety kind mm -hmm. of as we've talked you know i had a lot of things happening that were sucking the synergy out mm -hmm. of me so by the time i got sober it wasn't so victorious it was more me just like barely getting across the marathon mm -hmm. finish line and somebody putting a water bottle in my mouth you know so but comedy in and of itself is a is a heavy drinking culture mm -hmm. you know i've been in i was in green rooms in new york city recently you know where people are doing everything from smoking weed to other things mm -hmm. you know so it's beyond even the bottle mm -hmm. but it's uh i've also realized in comedy the more i've talked about my sobriety the room is about a split bag anymore so that's the kind of thing I, i'll encourage creatives also in any kind of way shape or form you only see what you're looking for. So if you're out there and you're just like, uh, 
everybody that I value is drinking. Like all my favorite rappers, my favorite author, you know, Hemingway was a drunk, well, cool. Then you'll only see that. But if you really kind of open your mouth and you're like, I have an intention to get sober or a desire, you'll start realizing that people that you, you think are way cooler than even those other people are also not drinking, are also not doing stuff. And often because they went through things just like this and have a very interesting sort of tale, to tell, but you know, a, a completely different changed life on the other side of what that looks like. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I've just been able to fortunately find a lot more camaraderie than I thought on mm -hmm. the sober side of the street of comedy. Mm -hmm. I've also just been able to watch myself do sets around my peers who are drinking mm -hmm. and have an understanding that there's no judgment there at all, but mm -hmm. that my performance is like incredibly bountifully benefited by the zero alcohol in me at all times, mm -hmm. you know? So it's not more like, oh, I'm better than you, but it's just simply like, I'm the best Hannah I can be, which guess what? Will make you the best comic you can be, the best anything you can be. Yeah, yeah. And what do you, what do you think of people who, do you think it's, Impossible. Would you say it's an impossible for someone who struggles with alcohol to drink in moderation? I know I can. Yeah. So I can only speak for myself and that's all I ever mm -hmm. try to do with all of this. And I encourage you just to speak for yourself. Whatever is your experience, don't let anyone else's like we were talking about. This isn't one bottle fits all. If you go to sure. a bar right now and you look up at their shelves, there's a million different types of booze. So if you think your sobriety is gonna take like the shape of another person's, like it may or may not. Mm -hmm. And you might also not stay sober because you're trying to mimic someone else's path. Sure. Like if I'm telling you there's a million paths, there are. Yeah. You know, and finding like exactly one that just like feels good for you is cool. And I've also had to like change it. My sure. sobriety changes on a day to day basis as far as how I approach it, mm -hmm. how I talk to it. Yeah. You know, what I even like the boundaries that you'll begin to construct for yourself are insane. You know, you frankly just won't talk to as many people anymore. Mm -hmm. Is that something you noticed when you became sober? Did you notice a disconnect with a lot of the people that you were around when you were drinking? There wasn't a big, big shift. I've still retained a lot of, I mean, the majority of my shows are full of people, of my buddies, you know, that have known me from when I was like laying, you know, waking up under little trees outside of, bars to now and even still imbibing themselves mm -hmm. but you know i definitely yeah it's it's definitely shifting mm -hmm. it's shifting all the time and i um uh, and i i'm shifting into that you know like i'm just like i'm figuring out and i'm tinkering with the entire mechanism mm -hmm. that is addiction mm -hmm. you know and i think that's kind of you know if you Instead of maybe looking at it like you're about to like lose everything you've ever had fun in your life, just like, just start realizing like you're just gonna go, you're gonna become a little explorer. Mm -hmm. What would your advice be to someone who thinks they might be struggling but not sure where to go next? If you're simply thinking that question in your brain, ever, like, do I potentially have a drinking problem? If you've even had that thought once, you most likely have a drinking problem because there's no one that knows you more than you. So that's simply your intuition beginning to ask those kinds of curious questions of you. Like, why are we doing this? You know, and for a lot of us, there are no good answers. We're like, oh, we're doing it because everyone's doing it because my mom is an alcoholic and I know I'm subject to that, so why fight against it? You know, and that sucks and that's hard. But I will say, you know, the stigma is shifting. Like, just understand there's something so like powerful and just like different available out there to you. Honestly, if you just have had, like I said, that thought, do I potentially need to get sober? Yeah, props. Now, from there, what can you do? A million things, like I said. You can talk to me, you can talk to anyone. You can go to a meeting, there's Zoom meetings now. That was like another thing someone told me, you'll never even have to turn on your microphone, you'll never have to say anything to anyone, like, oh, I'm an alcoholic. You can just sit in there now with community 
and an understanding that you're so not alone. Most people are battling some level of addiction on every fucking level. Um, and in honest ways, you know? So it's like, if it feels very covert and it feels like it's hard, it's just because that's kind of how you're viewing it and that's how society's made you view it, but it's really not. There are a ton of resources. There are, uh, there's just more channels than ever to get to feeling better. I mean, it, depending on where you're at with your alcoholism, I think you have the availability to do everything from go check yourself in somewhere. Mm -hmm. Like, remember, that's always available, you know, like I, I've never had to be like hospitalized for my drinking, but I definitely know I was drinking at not, like toxic levels to where that easily could have been a totally different story. You know, a little bit of my path is that I definitely, when I finally decided to hang it up, um, I had to reach out to some people and get some uh, accountability threads. Uh, strong sure. you know as far as like for me it was my kid sister a person that I honestly she didn't talk to me for two years of my alcoholism because I was so it was like hurting her so much to watch which I found so powerful at that time you know her creation of boundaries but at the same time you know so when I got sober I knew that that was a person who had my highest spiritual and personal and mental growth and awareness at hand. So honestly, that's what I'll say is my best advice. When you start reaching out to the people in your sobriety uh, for help, or just to say, hey, I think I might have a problem or do you, whatever, reach out to the people in your life that you know love you, that you know without a shadow of a doubt aren't leaving you on red. Like find those people that you know are concerned with the cultivation of your highest level of humanity because those are the humans that are gonna sit there while you fucking twitch out and whine and shame blame and you know, just like think, oh, can I do this or whatever? And you know, your brain is foggy. You're, for some of us, I mean, I was drunk. So like, I couldn't be putting together a plan if I tried, but those people that are not, can. Like I said, find those people that want you well, like that wish you well, because it's gonna like, you have to have them. And they're, they're, they think differently and they think clearly and they'll be able to just get you centered and grounded and that's what you kind of need in those like early tender moments is somebody just to like let you cry get quiet and be like hey I have no idea if this can stick for you but I'm going to stick you know that's like it's good for me to be emotional and I get emotional about this stuff because it's like it's literally your life but like people are so here for it so I think honestly it's just like getting real and looking around, it's like an understanding, like like we were saying, like even the internet, like just start Googling some shit. Mm -hmm. There's like, I can't even tell you probably what's available for you mm -hmm. to get to feeling better, but I just know there's so much, so yeah. Glad to have the cry thing, I cry <laughs> a lot. So um, nobody that knows me is like watching this right now and going, oh, Anna's emotional. <laughs> And I think we have to kind of get emotional. Like yeah, I'm just like I'm glad serious thing. I'm glad something is still moving me to tears. And so mm -hmm. I'm like, if that's still a conversation about alcohol, then I'm happy to have it. So it's like you gotta kind of be able to like if something's making you cry, like explore it. Like learn how to just like dry that off. Find the humans. You know, like I said, it's just finding the humans. They're out there. We're everywhere. I swear to God, we're everywhere. So just kind of, uh, yeah, that's what I would say. If the thought is there, get to talking about it, get real with it, get honest, understand it might take time. Like I said, I really drug my feet in an annoying way. Like it almost killed me a million times. Like I knew I had a problem, like I said, from the very start and I drank about it for 15 years. So like if you're sitting there and you're like, oh, it's too late, it's not, it's not, you know, and even, the first year and a half I did my dream job, like I was still blacking out, you know? So like even that is like nothing is beyond repair. Mm -hmm. Like nothing is beyond like the effort and that like beginning steps to like feel good or feel better because like there's so much more gas in the tank and if you don't fill it with bullshit drinks, well, 
You can fill it with not so bullshit dreams and then you can cry in front of people, you know, and clearly my mental health is <laughs> still something that I'm working through. But, you know, that's the thing. It's all just a day to day thing. You know, just get out there. Just try even a tolerance break. I'm glad to bring that up. Even if you're just like, hey, I don't know if I'm an alcoholic or this needs to be whatever. Take some time off. Take a week off. Take a month off. You'll just feel better. Your performance on every level will be optimized. Like, you, it'll amaze you. It'll blow your mind, even though it shouldn't. How things in your life that felt very insurmountable suddenly just disappear. Or you quickly get a solution for them. Or the people in your life that want to help you with things uh, help you because you're not, you know, swimming around in a kiddie pool full of malort. Let's just <laughs> get out of there. You know, you smell bad. You're weird. Like nobody wants you to hold their baby. It's a lot. Don't you want a fuller life? I don't know. That's all I'm saying. It's like, you can only black out in Lakeview so much. Like it's not cool, you know, and that's a lot of just that shifting stigma. So just understand there's a lot of ways. There's a lot of people that are going to make you feel dumb about your sobriety. There's a lot of people that are going to make you understand that you're holding quite frankly, the key to your own life and power and happiness here on earth. So like you can decide what you value and think is cool, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't think any, many of the cool kids anymore think that it's alcohol, mm -hmm. no matter what they try to make it seem like on TV. So, you know, it's like even euphoria, you know, like I gulped so those kids could drink. Mm -hmm. But the point is, I'm glad that even there's some things and people that are being portrayed at the highest level of addiction on TV, even if it looks like to some people that that's a glamorization of what's happening. It's also humanizing mm -hmm. and it's very real. And I don't watch Euphoria because I know I have Rue in me. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that they built those characters on like the messes that are out there. But at the same time, you know, we can clean messes up. You know, a mess isn't your wood grain. You just have to just kind of just look for some people who are ready to kind of get to work, do some buffing. So like I said, no quick fixes, but a lot of ways to start feeling ease. Yeah. Clean this mess up. Clean it I up. I like that. <laughs> Find some people that want to go to your beach, dude. If it's Hollywood Beach, get out there. And yeah. Clean it up. Yeah. It's okay. Some of the shit you thought was trash isn't. You don't even have to pick it up. Mm -hmm. But some of it you'll realize, you're like, that is going to cut my foot every time I walk across it. So find the buddies that are uh, conscious of uh, those kinds of efforts. Mm -hmm. That's it. Get, you know, if you don't want to drink, you're probably not going to be around people that are drinking all the time, and that's hard to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you again so much for, you know, sharing your story. And I know a lot of this is very heavy, but I think you're going to, your story and these resources all, and all of this is, you know, really going to help people. Oh. And that's what we're trying to do here. So <laughs> you guys are like, we're going to start drinking. Um, that <laughs> no, was no. a lot. <laughs> no, we appreciate it. And, you know, this is stuff we want to share to people and, you know, remove kind of the stigma from I a do lot too. of this stuff. I, you know, I do so too. So people are it's more like, open about it, you know? Yes. And that's okay. If you're not open about it, that's what I, it's also okay. Be kind of closed, but go talk to a couple people. Yeah. Like you don't have to blur, like put it on blast like I do and mm -hmm. just be some sort of beacon, you know, for brokenness. But I also, I'm going to say, if you can hear the sound of my voice and you got gas in the tank, the empire's burning and people really could use the benefit of your voice and your knowledge and your understanding and your even just ability to talk through dark. So probably open it up for good for once. Let's try. A bunch of us must. Um, yeah, that's it. Wow. You have so many interesting points and thoughts you've had and you know, insight that um, you've shared with us. Um, I really appreciate you coming out today and, you know, sharing some of your story. Um, you know, you can follow you on Instagram at Hander Pump Rules. Is Hander that correct? Pump Rules, yeah. And um, some of your shows and kind of updates and everything is up on there as well. Is that correct? Yeah, several times a month here in Chicago, I'm up at the Laugh Factory and then I, uh, I update my socials religiously so you'll be able to see anywhere that i am but i'm all over town or i'm you know honestly traveling i spend half the month on the road indiana new york la kind of running that circuit uh 
but as you can tell, I mean, more than I know comedy, I know alcoholism and that kind of stuff and it's clearly in me to talk about and it's something that is valuable to me so in any way that you need a laugh if you just also need somebody to to help you know let you understand that this is uh it's out there and it's okay i'm also right here so we're just maybe not forever but you know we appreciate it thank you so much and if you are struggling with you know, alcohol or any other substances, like Hannah said, there are a lot of resources out there for you. Um, And you can actually check out everything on our app for some of those resources as well. So thank you all for tuning in today. And thank you, Hannah. And we'll see you next time. You know, there's, there's, like I said, you have to find several things to keep the mind busy. People think depression goes away. It never goes away. You know, I want people to understand that that's something that never happens. You're going to be sad. You're going to be down. These things are gonna happen eventually, you know? But you have to find that moment to just say, I, I need this to get through it, or I need this to get through it. And it doesn't have, and the sad part is sometimes we look to drugs and alcohol, and it's such a horrible vice to do it. Cause I did it, I relied on it, and I went through overdoses through it, you know? And because you wanna find something to just, I wanna numb the pain. There's other healthy ways to do it. Go for a walk, you know? Go, you know, sightseeing, go to the beach, go swimming. Anything that you feel fulfilled in your heart, 